Hi, this is Ryan. What you're about to hear is a bonus episode of MASH Matters that has nothing to do with the television series MASH, but it does have a connection to our very own Jeff Maxwell. Jeff spent a significant portion of his early years in show business on the lot at 20th Century Fox. That's why best-selling author Stephen Rebello asked Jeff to share some of his behind-the-scenes stories from the Fox lot in his new book, Dolls, 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 Deep Inside Valley of the Dolls, the most beloved bad book and movie of of all time. In this bonus episode, Jeff and Steven reconnect to tell more stories from a legendary time in motion picture history. If you're a fan of movies, we think you will enjoy this interview with Steven Rebello. Okay, so this is MASH Matters, and to those of you who are listening, uh, you might be scratching your head saying, T, uh, you're going to do an interview with Mr. Stephen Rebello, and he's written a great book called Dolls, Dolls, Dolls. Uh, why is he on MASH Matters? Well, I'll tell you. First of all, the book Dolls, Dolls, Dolls is drop dead good. And anyone who wants to know or enjoy behind the scenes of Hollywood and filmmaking, if you don't get this, you're depriving yourself of a wonderful experience. So go out and buy several copies of the book. <laughs> it's, and, and I mean this, this is not I'm trying to sell books for somebody. It's really, really good. And it's exceptionally good because I'm quoted in it, which is really interesting, but it's a wonderful behind the scenes look at a kind of a train wreck of a movie called Valley of the Dolls. And uh, Stephen has taken this movie on and taken the behind the scenes of all of the movie and really kind of defined it for all of us and showed it to us. So Stephen Rebello, thank you for being on MASH Matters and we welcome you here today. I feel very welcomed and that was such a great introduction. I should leave now. <laughs> yeah, it's really yeah, it's not going to get better than that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's going down from here. And I, I just want you to know you're in great company. This is a classy organization. We're not a cheap goofball bunch of guys. So do know that. Well, then I'm certainly leaving. <laughs> uh, you've written a, a really terrific book and I I want to ask you some questions about your motivation for doing it, number one. And what, well, can we hear a little bit about your history? You didn't kind of start out to be a, a screenwriter or an author. I was a therapist. I was a clinical therapist in Boston. I had a private practice and I uh, was a supervisor in a department at a Harvard affiliated teaching hospital in Boston. So that's, you know, really how I kind of launched my career. But I do have to say that as a student, way back when I was always writing and I was, you know, a co-editor of a school newspaper and I was, I don't know, maybe I was, I don't know, I think it was nine or 10. And I, I used to call Alfred Hitchcock up on the phone because <laughs> I didn't know that one wasn't supposed to. And, supposed to. <laughs> and, and, and the, 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 what the, do you want, young man? <laughs> yes, yes. You're pretty much, he was, I don't know what happened, but I just caught him on a bunch of really good days and he would always accept my phone call. So anyway, so I was always, sort of leading this double life. And, and actually, when I was uh, working as a therapist, you you have to be in therapy yourself. And you, you know, you're always writing reports on patients that are, you know, they're blinded so that your supervising therapist doesn't know who the people are. But my supervisors kept saying to me, you're a real writer. I mean, these, these sound like half hour TV shows. <laughs> and I wasn't doing that intentionally. It's just always the way I've written and, and sometimes spoken. And, and so, you know, there, so there was sort of this clarion call coming to me. And I, I was, um, I, you know, I was, I was launching into a doctoral career starting at Harvard and I, um, I, I had a break and I came out to Los Angeles to, um, you know, spend some time, I, you know, so I, anyway, so I was at a party, but, but anyway, so somebody said, well, you know, while you're out here, if you'd like to be a writer or if you'd like to, you know, dip your toe into professional writing, why don't you interview somebody who would you like to interview? Huh. And I said, like a shot, I would like to interview Al for Hitchcock. And I felt something shift in my destiny as I said that aloud. Wow. That's really cool. What a, what a neat moment that must have been. It was. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. And, uh, yeah. and, and as neat was someone saying at that moment, well, here, I'm, I'll write down his phone number for you. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and you said, pshaw. <laughs> and in fact, had his phone number. And uh, so I checked with people at Harvard and I checked with the, with the Crimson, the newspaper. And I, I, I checked with some people at underground newspapers in Boston. And I said, look, hey, if I get an interview with Alfred Hitchcock, will you publish it? And it was always sight unseen. Yes, we will. So I uh, so I did that interview, uh, which was just an incredible experience. And it turned out to be the last interview he gave. He passed away. Wow. Oh my and so that interview was published all around the world. Hmm. I suddenly had credentials as a writer and people started knocking on my door. And that's how it started. I'm sorry, I rambled for 20 minutes. No, no, no. Hey, I, I, I asked the question. I, I think that's fascinating. I, I love the fact that you had a, a, a moment there where something, you know, resonated and rocked in you. Boy, you know, those are very important moments we all need to pay attention to and respond to. Yeah. And you wrote, it's called Alfred Hitchcock and the Making of Psycho? Yes. Yeah. Wow. And bestseller, by the way. Yes. And still in print and still uh, going to town. And um, it just kept selling and selling, uh, even though it was a very small publisher who literally died during the publication of the book. You know, I'm getting a theme here. I don't know. (laughs) Alfred Hitchcock died. The publisher died. I'm not sure we want to keep this conversation going. It's been great talking to you, Stephen. Thank you. I'm feeling a little dizzy, uh, Stephen. (laughs) I'd hang up if I were you. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, the Hitchcock book was optioned by a number of TV networks and uh, film studios. And I think at last count, I think there were six screenplay drafts of that. And and, and in any case, um, it was eventually made into a film in in 2012 called, uh, what do they call it? Oh, Hitchcock. That's right. Yeah, (laughs) Hitchcock. Yeah. Starring Anthony Hopkins and Scarlett Johansson and Helen Mirren and on and on. And so that That is so nice of you to give those young actors a break. I, you know, I'm, that's how I rule. I'm that guy, you know, so many people have been good to me. I, yeah. I have to be good to the little people, you know? So, um, so yeah, I mean, so that was, um, that was a, a mixed experience, but a lucky experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time fending ideas and offers for, Hey, why don't you do another making a book? Because that really was something, but, you know, zing, go the strings of your heart only when something really called. Mm-hmm. You know, Valley of the Dolls had been in and out of my life from the time I was a, a wee little thing in Massachusetts. And I thought, um, there's something nagging at me about this. So let me um, let me explore it. So that's how that happened. Wow. You say nagging at you when you were a wee child. So had you read the book or were your parents hiding it under the covers or? <laughs> yeah, well, my, my mom was hiding it in her unmentionables drawer. Okay. <laughs> which is, which uh, we shouldn't mention that. Uh. Well, well, it's too late. Um, but, but, uh, which is probably where it belonged. Uh, but, but I mean, I love that that's how she thought it should be. I would never find it there. Of course, that's where she always hid, whether it was Peyton Place or, you know, the tight white collar. I read all that. I was voracious. I read everything. Yeah. So I read, you know, I read the book long before I should have. And I don't think I understood it all. But I, yeah. I knew enough to know that it was naughty. And and I, I certainly had my ear to the ground, uh, to the pop culture ground, even in Massachusetts, where, yeah. you know, Jacqueline Suzanne was on television all the time. And um, everybody was, I mean, I heard people talking about Valley of the Dolls, it, honestly, as I heard uh, people talking and whispering about Psycho. So it was a thing in my mind, you know, Valley of the Dolls and what that meant, culture at the time, uh, what it meant to small town women uh, like my mom and, and her sisters who, you know, who I believe all read it. But I, because I heard my mom and other women talking about it, I heard what it meant to them, which was kind of what I heard my mom talking about once with, she was talking about Rona Jaffe's book, The Best of Everything, Mm -hmm. another 20th century Fox picture, Mm -hmm. as was Peyton Place. And what I got, what I got from my mom, especially, was that someone was actually daring to write a a book or a bunch of books, Grace Metallius, Rona Jaffe, Jackie Suzanne, about women who refused to stay in their lane about women who wanted more than straight up marriage with a guy and this happens and this happens and the trajectory is pretty laid out. And my mom was a remarkable uh, person and she was one of those women who would not stay in her lane. And so even as a kid and as I was growing up, it was less easy for me to laugh and snigger at Valley of the Dolls because I'd seen kind of the impact that it had on uh, someone like my mother. So, you know, so that was like tucked into my brain. 
Years ago, I did a book, uh, I co-wrote a book called Bad Movies We Love uh, with Ed Margulies. Uh, there was a magazine in this crazy town called Moving Line once upon a time. And it was a, I think it was kind of a sort of spy magazine, if people remember that, of movies and that the people who wrote for it loved movies, but also were wise to movies. So uh, Bad Movies We Love became a column in the uh, in the magazine. And, and, and what that what that column was about was, and I was asked to, uh, you know, co-write that column with Ed Margulies, who, who launched it, was, um, you know, a look at really big budget, big star, uh, you know, high expectation movies that were just flat out hilarious, unintentionally. I mean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know the game, the minute somebody is winking and you know they're mocking or joking, it's no longer a bad movie we love. It's like you're in on the joke. But, but these were made by people who were not in on the joke. And so they're emoting like blazes. And there are a few things I find funnier than, you know, wig pulling and, and chest beating. And, and did you did you mention Valley of the Dolls in the column? Uh, no, we saved it for the book. Oh, OK. Because it was just that good and bad. And so it became part of it. That was really part of it. It became part of like the pantheon of the baddest of the bad or the best of the worst, however you want to look. Yeah. And so after that book was quite successful and and uh, TNT had Ed and I do uh, a bunch of movie marathons where uh, we posed as two confirmed bachelors. You can nudge, nudge and wink, wink all you like on that one. <laughs> my um, sort of my conceit for that, I wrote the bumps. I, I did the bumpers for the, you know, I wrote characters for us. Um, yeah, the idea was that, you know that we were two. We were two guys who lived in this Manhattan penthouse, and uh, we we um, you know we were vaguely connected to the movie industry. But our neighbors were people like Sharon Stone or Pia Zadora. And, uh, <laughs> Pia Zadora, wow, there's a name. Oh <laughs> well, yeah, Pia Zadora. I, oh, yeah. I got a million of them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that was the conceits, and they would. And the idea was that, was that they would drop over those uh, stars, and they'd watch movies with us, and we'd rip on them. How fun! Yeah. So Turner didn't want to do any of that because they didn't want to spend the money. So they had us do, they had us in this sort of, I, I always described it as a penthouse out of a Ross Hunter movie, you know, Ross Hunter would, yeah. you know, he made <laughs> imitation of the life and portrait in black and all of that. And, and, and that was a lot of fun. And because I love a gimmick, I would write a, an episode where this episode is filmed entirely in Lana vision <laughs> as opposed to Panavision because we were showing a, a marathon of Lana Turner movies. So. Yeah, Lana vision. Yeah, so we, we got a whole lot of interesting fans uh, out of that. And believe me, I am getting to a point. The whole notion was a, a couple of publishers came to us and said, why don't you guys write together a uh, like a one book uh, about one movie that you, you particularly think is wonderful? So uh, we, of course, in unison said, value the dolls. Ah, aha. And, um, you know, unfortunately, Ed passed away very, very young. But, you know, he left his traces, you know, kind of on on the project and the memory. And I, I didn't want to touch it for a lot of years. But I thought, you know, I thought like about two years ago, you know, I want to have fun. I mean, you know, we've got, we've got crazy in the White House. The, the, the world is really dark. I would like to have some fun. I'd like to write a book that would be fun and hopefully it would be interesting and fun for other people. And so I thought, you know, for my own sake, for Ed's memory, for finding some fun again. Oh, and by the way, you know, after Bad Movies We Love, I was actually contacted by some producers who said, you know, we have the rights to Valley of the Dolls and we would like you to, are you interested in writing a movie? either a remake, a sequel, or something. And so I had, I had a bunch of meetings about that. And um, were, were they part of the original <laughs> gang who... No, no, uh, no, they weren't. But wow. please, don't steal my punchline. Oh, uh, I'm, no. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> no, sorry. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Exactly. Anyway, so we had, you know, they were, they were from a very big company. And as we had a series of meetings and they, and they said, you know, we've, we've come up with this idea and see, see what you, and, and by the way, so I pitched them how my Valley of the Dogs sequel should begin which was uh, one of the characters is uh, climbing to the top of the Hollywood sign and she's about to jump. The Patty Duke character, of course, mm-hmm. right? And the press is below. And, and it was very sort of ace in the hole, you know, very Sunset Boulevard, very dark, very funny. And they said, you know, we have this idea that it would be cool for you and Carrie Fisher to write this together. So, uh, you know, they were setting up all these meetings and Carrie Fisher never showed up. I, you know, I met Carrie Fisher and I never had the nerve to ask her, did you ever hear about this or was this all? Well, anyway, it, it all evaporated. But so I'm 
long, um, we had a long tortured history with uh, Valley of the Dolls. So for one moment, I have to say, just in case anybody does not actually know what Valley of the Dolls is, this is going to be a very short thing. It's a best-selling novel chronicling the rise and fall of three young women in show business. That's kind of the elevator pitch. So anybody who wants to know more about it, they can go out and buy her book. But that's basically what Valley of the Dolls was kind of about. Or as my mom once called it, lots of suffering in big wigs and minks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Valley of the Dolls was a movie that I had a you know, sort of weird, complex relationship to in, in that I found it hysterically funny. But honestly, the Sharon Tateness of it all always made me very sad. Uh, someone is extraordinarily pretty and for everything that we know about her, a truly nice person that was cut so short. So yeah, it, it, the movie starred Barbara Parkins, Patty Duke and Sharon Tate. And they beat out, um, you know, virtually any woman. That you you know, that's just so what's interesting reading the book. They beat out everybody. When you read the book, you it's it's just a, uh, it's a never ending parade of actresses who are thought about, considered, auditioned. It's overwhelming. It's stunning. My mouth, yeah. mouth dropped that everybody went through that. And there were so many suggestions in the big kahunas that Daryl Zanuck and Richard Zanuck and what they went through in terms of their own opinions about actresses and who should be in it, who shouldn't be. And then the directors. I, I mean, I don't think there was a, a human actress left <laughs> in terms of considering. It's stunning. What you write is just amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, it's it's like everyone from any child star that you can mention who wanted to yeah. change her image to Marjorie Maine. I mean, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody yeah. thought that they were right for this movie. And yeah. And, but, but, you know, in all fairness, lots of really big women uh, that they wanted to turn them down. But there was a constant parade of, you know, beautiful women, you know, your Natalie Woods, your Jane Fonda's, your Faye Dunaway. I mean, on and on and on. One of the things that I find so fascinating about show business is that whether Valley of the Dolls was a good movie or not, because I'm sure a lot of the same process goes through good movies as opposed to not so good movies. But the fact that so much work and so much uh, attention is given to those kinds of details. I mean, I guess you're talking about, you know, investing millions of dollars. Everybody wants to make sure you're doing the right thing. But in reality, nobody really knows if you're doing the right thing. It's a good guess. You know, based on your taste, your understanding of talent, uh, what you perceive for the project. And it's just the best guess you've got at that moment. And it, there's so much attention, though, that happens and so much work goes into this thing, whether it's a good movie or it's a bad movie. And and that happens throughout show business constantly. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. And, and you know, um, whatever you think of how Valley of the Dolls turned out, as you said, the people that they hired, I mean, not not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera or the people that they went after. I mean, you know, in terms of screenwriters and directors, they were going after the best in the business. Yeah. You know, look at the production designer, the multiple Academy Awards, the cinematographer shot with Greta Garbo and Joan Crawford and Norma Shearer at MGM. Top, top, top people. And, and the whole screenwriter parade that went on, you know, from science fiction writer Harlan Ellis who wrote the first very detailed uh, treatment for this. And then uh, the two successive women whom they hired were both Academy Award winners, both really smart, wealthy people. I mean, one of them spoke Sanskrit or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> seriously, probably. I'd like to hear that accent. Why do you speak Sanskrit? I want to hear her do a pitch in Sanskrit. <laughs> Yeah. And then the dynamics, what I love about in the book, and this is kind of where it starts to touch my heart, the fact that this uh, all kind of took place at 20th Century Fox, where I spent uh, 14 or 15 years of my life. But the dynamics that you write about between Daryl Zanuck and Richard Zanuck and David Brown and various other people who come in to try and get this thing going, the conflicts between the father and the son and the relationships between the executives of the studios and how that impacted not only the movie, but all of the actresses and 
actors who came in to do it and what their opinions were and how they behaved. And anybody who's interested in kind of behind the scenes of show business and how a movie gets made, go out and buy the book because it's really fascinating. You really get a sense and a real taste of what goes on. It's a real business and a lot of business goes on and a lot of sometimes dirty business goes on as well uh, behind the scenes of getting these things done. But but you talk about that and, and Daryl Zanuck and Richard Zanuck, again, because that really intrigued me because of the 20th Century Fox connection. And you were very kind enough to contact me and say, hey, I'm, I'm doing a book about Valley of the Dolls and would you you know, like to talk to me about it. And at first I thought, well, uh, you know, I didn't produce it or I wasn't in it, but I was at the studio and we had a delightful conversation that I thought was going to be short. We spent, (laughs) it was about four hours, I think, after we (laughs) we were kept talking. And I kind of spilled my guts to you about my relationship with 20th Century Fox. And that's where the movie was produced and all of the players, the Zanuck, guys and everybody were the executives of the studio. And because Fox is a real important place in my history, I kind of grew up there. And so like you're saying, when you were a kid and Valley of the Dolls, you know, flew into your head, Fox flew into my life. And so not only was it a business place that I got to go to, that I made money at, but it was an emotional connection. It was a real place that I felt comfortable with. I bonded with. I loved being there. I loved what it looked like and what it smelled like and all of the secret places that I can go and discover things. And the fact that it was an iconic place that, you know, iconic movie stars walked those roads, which, you know, turned me on because that's what I love. So thank you, Stephen, for even inviting me to share anything I knew about the studio. And I thank you for sort of including some of the comments that we talked about in the book. Oh, I, I loved uh, talking with you. And, and you you helped to bring that era. And, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, because it was, you know, Hollywood shifting uh, gears uh, from old Hollywood to new Hollywood. And that was painful for a lot of people. But, but you really brought it home. There was a lot more of you, believe me, in, you know, the early earlier drafts, but they needed to make cuts. And I'm really sorry that some of you ended up on the cutting room floor. I've been there before. <laughs> I, I know you have. I, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually thinking I'm going to do a you know, website where I have portraits of people like you and include the stuff that was cut so that people can get an even bigger sense. Because honestly, the, the people that are buying the book, and I'm, I'm really grateful to say that they are, and they're responding like gangbusters, they want more. They want more details. But, you know, this because of you, the 20th Century Fox swimming pool and the legends <laughs> that surround it, you know, are pretty remarkable. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm so grateful and I had such a good time. We did have a good time. And, you know, I always wanted to, to walk around the studio with you and say, here's where we're this and that, and the, you know, show you personally what I was seeing, what I was experiencing. We didn't get a chance to do that. But I hope you were able to do that. I did. I did all of that. Great. And I could uh, I could see certain starlets ducking in. In and out of certain doors, <laughs> and uh, you know, and the and the uh, the grottos and the the secret trysting places. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a remarkable lot, and the ghosts are very uh, they're very much alive there. I was really struck by a lot of it. Um, you know, Ernest Lehman, who was really a great screenwriter and was at 20th Century Fox for a number of movies. You know, he wrote North by Northwest and he adapted The Sound of Music and the Port Noise Complaint and so many movies. Anyway, he was my mentor and uh, he took me there almost the week I came to California and he showed me to his offices and all around the writer's building, the executive building. He showed me actually a window where the writers hated him so much they hung him out the window by his ankle. Um, <laughs> wow. Which sounds like a... Uh, uh, Sid Caesar, Mel Brooks uh, yeah. kind of story, but I, I'm, I know it happened to Ernie because he was that kind of guy. Yeah, I, I wanted the book to be a portrait of Hollywood at that time and specifically of Fox at that time because it, it was and is legendary and now now it's being erased. It is. Yeah, it's 20th century uh, mouse, actually. No. Now, now, wait, are you guys going to say, oh, yeah, well, you killed Fox too, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so among the casualties, we have Hitchcock, we have 20th. Uh, Century Fox. <laughs> oh God! No, I wasn't going to say Ryan was probably thinking it, but I wasn't going to say. He's been very quiet. I know he's. I know. He's, I'm just sitting back and enjoying the conversation. <laughs> well, I, you know, the, the things that I really loved about you know doing doing this book was that it you know talking to, to someone like 
Mr. Maxwell, it comes alive because he was in the commissary. Mm -hmm. He he saw those murals. He knew what the buzz and the energy was like. And it was so wonderful. I tell Ryan this. You did a wonderful thing. You mentioned Doris, the waitress, (laughs) who was older woman, blonde hair, bleach kind of blonde hair, the sweetest person. And she talked like this. Hi, honey. How you doing? You're going to have the cheeseburger. It's the best thing in the restaurant. Come on, have the cheeseburger. (laughs) I mean, the character of that person. And you're going through that you're talking to Doris and then you turn to the left and there's Cary Grant. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> that was that was the fun and the spark and the thrill of being in an environment like that is is having all those things happen to you. At least it was for me. Someone asked me a little bit more about Dick Zanuck and I said, well, did you know that he'd, he'd run around the lot, you know, jogging every day and the secretaries would look out the window and they were, <laughs> and that comes from you. And, and uh, yeah. you know, those kinds of details are you know, they'll be gone unless someone gets them down on paper. Yeah. Yeah. My, my little Xerox office where I was in the executive building and I was Xeroxing inter-office memos, which was really exciting and interesting to read sometimes. <laughs> and then yeah, about three o'clock every day, he would get out and run around the entire perimeter of the studio in his little shorts. And everybody would go, oh, well, can he come back in? There, you know, I certainly I didn't. <laughs> I wasn't involved with him in the business, but he was always a very nice guy. You know, he was always pleasant and friendly and he smiled. And, you know, I was just the guy Xeroxing things, but he was always very courteous to me and pleasant. We'd chat for a minute, you know, and then he'd go into his office. So I always kind of thought he was a cool guy. He, it kind of reminded me of a frat boy. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of always respected him for knowing that he knew I was one of those guys who wanted to be in show business and wanted to be a studio guy or wanted. He, I was there for a reason. And he knew that's what was going on. And I was just pranking what was happening. So I love it. That's why I always like. Yeah, that was fun. That was a fun deal. Yeah. But yeah. So you you really in our conversation, you brought all that back for me. It came flooding back. And uh, so that's a real thrill in reading your book, too. It comes flooding back as well as well as learning so much about the movie process and trying to create this movie. You must have truly enjoyed all this. I mean, writing all that stuff had to have been a lot of fun. It was. Well, you know, I'm a storyteller. And what makes things alive for me are interactions between people. And on this, there were then, especially, not a lot of movies made where the cast was primarily female. And a number of these women bonded and became very close friends. Uh, Barbara Parkins, you know, went on to be Sharon's maid of honor at her wedding. And Patty Duke and and Sharon went out regularly to um, any number of restaurants that we three could name check. But it was a heated set. I mean, they were... um, It wasn't going well. (laughs) Mark Robeson, who was the director, you know, big deal. He had directed Peyton Place, uh, the movie, to big box office and lots and lots and lots of money. Um, You know, he directed William Holden and Grace Kelly in The Bridges of Toko Reed. He directed Ingrid Bergman. I mean, big deal guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he just, with these women, he seemed uh, unable to communicate with them. And uh, his and Patty Duke's headbutting, you know, really became legendary. And um, his treatment toward Judy Garland, who was hired for the movie and was let go, you know, in less than two weeks of filming and non-filming, his uh, treatment of her was uh, despicable. You know, so, I mean, I sensed that the filming was rife with the drama, but as I researched and and found people who were there and were actually there on the set, uh, even journalists who literally were there on the set when Judy Garland was imploding, uh, which was a shock to me that, that someone was allowed on the set and he reported exactly what went on. I wanted to do something where readers would feel almost they're there. They're there. Mm-hmm. You know, the movie, the movie is happening right now. It's being made and they're on the set, uh, you know, with this, you know, remarkable and eclectic and strange group of people. And not a lot of them are getting along really well. So the drama was inherent, was up to me to tease it out and and verify it uh, so that I could make it gettable and relatable to readers. You know, one thing that's making me very happy about this is that (laughs) one reviewer is calling it scholarly and meticulous, and then Vogue magazine puts it on their best dishiest reads of the summer. I mean, (laughs) you know, and it's the same book, right? Yeah. So I'm really grateful, though, that people are queuing in to what matters to them and what is most interesting to them. I've had so 
many people call me or text me or, you know, write me about how I handled Patty Duke's mental challenges as she was making this movie because she was suffering from then undiagnosed bipolar disease. And a lot of what the press then called shenanigans and acting out uh, she was doing were really manifestations of the disease that she was fighting uh, unsuccessfully because how could she since there was no diagnosis, there were no, you know, medications, there were no psychiatric treatments except the generic ones that she was undergoing. And so many people have contacted me about uh, saying, you know, you could, you really could have made this kind of a, a camp fest or a bitchy fest and you didn't do that. No. It's dishy and there's there's lots and lots of gossip on every page, but you didn't report it with a, a sense of malice. It's it's uh, compassion. No, no, that, no. That stuff really makes me feel good because it wasn't my intention to drag anybody. No, you, and you didn't. You really gave me insight. I didn't know all of that information about Patty Duke. I kind of somewhere in the back of my head, I knew a little bit about it, but not really. And so I you know, you really described it and, and wrote about it beautifully in that so I could identify with it, be sympathetic to it. And, you know, I felt terrible <laughs> for Patty Duke, which is an interesting thing because part of the issues of Valley the Doll is not only is the, uh, you know, the op- opioid addiction, which is, you know, so prevalent today, uh, but the pressure on women in show business and the, just generally the pressure on everybody. I mean, I think when you describe the dynamics between Daryl Zanuck and his son, Richard, just that pressure alone could bring people to their knees. I mean, that's a that's a huge chasm between those two guys and all this power going on, all that stuff happening. Yeah, it was a real edible battle between those two. And it was, you know, it was a battle for the soul and the survival of the studio. Um, it was a clash between old Hollywood and new Hollywood, yeah. but it was intensely personal. It was hurtful. I mean, I, I think of them as a father and son on the HBO series Succession, only uh, they were meaner than <laughs> Succession. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, was, this is a battle to the death. Yeah. You know, all these two titans are clashing. The women uh, on the movie were really getting crushed. They were kind of pawns in the game. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, as I researched it and, and talked to people like you and others, it just became, at least for me, a bigger and bigger, more universal, relatable story as opposed to, uh, you know, merely listening at the keyhole and peeking through the door of Hollywood. Right. All of that in and of itself is fascinating. Yeah, it sure is. This is especially to people like us. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, us low lives who want to go on. You know, <laughs> well, I, I got lucky because when I got associated with MASH, thank God. I was surrounded by people who were kind of adults and the pressure was there, but it wasn't the demeaning kind of pressure. There wasn't the pressure that could, you know, unravel somebody and take somebody down. That that mean spiritedness, whatever that is in somebody that does that and whatever, you know, Robeson was going through and why he had to do that to somebody, nothing like that was around me for nine years. And and but it was still a business. It was still mashed. There was still a lot of money involved. It was still 20th Century Fox. Sure. But none of that showed up anywhere uh, and the actors the producers the writer anywhere how, how lucky you were really oh boy yeah i was yeah i was very lucky i'm glad you didn't get scarred <laughs> <laughs> no seriously i mean you did in other ways but we won't go there yeah <laughs> certainly but you know for some of the the men and women who were making uh, valley of the dolls it it took a toll sure it was a price to be paid and yet many of these people when the when the picture was done never wanted to see each other again yeah and what did the xanax do immediately because the box office was gigantic. You know, they kept the budget very reasonable and they just kept making money hand over fist. So immediately, let's call Jackie and have her write a sequel. Yeah. And and she did. And there's a whole, you know, second or third act in the book about how Jacqueline Suzanne's Beyond the Valley of the Dolls became Russ Meyer and Roger Ebert's Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And they're nothing alike. Uh, the movie that Jackie had in mind was a literal continuation of the story of the these women, the, the women who survived the first movie, but there were going to be flashbacks to Sharon Tate's characters earlier uh, uh, years. But Barbara Parkins was going to be the lead of it. And, you know, her lion Burke, Paul Burke, the actor who was going to come back and play that role. And But it was going to be international and expensive and druggy and more heartbreak, more wigs, more minks, you know, all, all that stuff. And, and uh, you know, for a while, Jackie and, and those other women thought that that was the movie that was going to get made 
made and the, the Xanax were playing uh, a very, very nasty game with them where they were promising them everything and just throwing them under the bus for a uh, very low budget X rated approach, be, be, you know, because they're saying, well, they're too, you know, Jackie's too expensive. She's too be, big a pain in the ass. We don't want to pay those actresses to come back. They didn't like each other. It's just going to be, you know, more of the same. So anyways, wild, wild stuff. And I, I always say to Ryan, Ryan is a, an accomplished actor and director and marketing guru back in Illinois. Mm-hmm. And I say, hey, Ryan, come on out here. I, I bet you money. You could audition for stuff and get a good job in a television show or something. Yeah. And he just won't do it. And now, Ryan, you hear all the how well everything works. I don't understand why you don't. Yeah, come, come on down. Why would you want to miss out on this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that's backbiting and infighting. And yeah. yeah, sounds great. Yeah, come on. <laughs> you, know, you know, well, as, as one of the characters in Valley of the Dolls, somebody says to her, "I told you, show business was a you know was a rotten business," and she goes, "Yeah, but I love it." Well, uh, Stephen, I I want to thank you. We both want to thank you for spending time with us. I adore the book, and I'm I'm saying this truthfully from my heart. Anybody that's interested in not just even the movie Valley of the Dolls, but just you just want to feel what it's like to be in a studio lot and experience how a movie gets made and all of the different ins and outs of that whole process. You really got to go out and get the book because it's it's you won't be able to stop turning the page. Except when you get to my parts, then you can read them over and over. <laughs> I, I have, uh, I've got the digital version. I downloaded it and I have the hard copy and I'm going to send it to you and you're going to sign it and you have to send it back to me because, of course, we can't see each other anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's really a drag. Well, there, you, you don't have the audio book, so you need to jump on that. I got to get that too. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for this. I really enjoyed it, guys. Thank you. Stephen Rabello's new book, Dolls, 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 Deep Inside Valley of the Dolls, the most beloved bad book and movie of all time, is available now from your favorite bookseller. You can find a link to the book in the show notes for this episode at mashmatterspodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and here's looking up your old address.